Greetings, Patty. First of all, let me thank you for agreeing to do this interview with me today over Zoom. Here, I'm, I'm really happy to be here, Guy. Well, thank you. We're here to talk about your new book, the latest in this series of books that you've been writing. And this one is entitled, Write Better Multiple Choice Questions to Assess Learning. For our audience, would you please give us a little bit about your professional background before we launch into the book review? Yeah, happy to. I'll make it real short. Um, my background mostly was in business. Um, and I have had a degree in economics um, and, um, and then got really interested in how people learn and, and how people do their jobs. Because as a business person, it's really difficult to help people learn to do a good job so that the business can, can survive if they don't, if we don't understand learning. And as I got more and more interested in that, learned more and more about it, I took on a position as a trainer, um, which is interesting because many of us started as, as subject matter experts and I, I'm no, no different. Um, and then it fascinated me so much that I just kept going and kept learning. Um, and like you, I believe, I think this is like the best job there possibly can be. It's just fantastic. So, I mean, that's the, the short. I mean, I've done a lot of things in my life, but most of the last half of my career has been devoted to, to the design of instruction. Well, thank you for that. So let's now shift to uh, our focus for today, which is on your book, Write Better Multiple Choice Questions to Assess Learning. I'd like to start off uh, the fact that I did a reviewer quote for you after reviewing your book. I read the whole thing, the uh, earlier edition of it. And so this was my quote. This is a very worthy addition to the library of every instructional developer, designer, and even every analyst. Patty provides much more than just how to create valid multiple choice questions and does so in an easy to read and very actionable manner. So my follow-up to that is, did you change anything in the version that I read that would cause me to want to rewrite those words? No. Um, the book, the book uh, went through a lot of changes um, over time as people give you feedback and you realize, oh, yeah, that's, that's not only a good idea, I must do that. Um, so, but, but the book didn't change. It, it got reformatted a little bit where I put things. So it's the same. And thank you so much for that quote. I really appreciate it. Oh, you're more than welcome. I've, I've enjoyed all of your books. And we'll, we'll talk about those near the end here of the, of the other books and the next one that you're working on. But let's start with my three-part question, which is, who did you write this for? Why did you write it? And what do you hope the takeaways are for the readers? Well, I'd like to start with why. Um, the why is, is kind of interesting. I never set out to be a multiple choice questions guru, but multiple choice questions are so common. And I, I did enough research to realize, unlike what people say about them, they're not bad. They're just written bad. <laughs> so so the, the multiple choice questions can be well used, but they are hard to write well. And so I started writing notes for my clients who asked me for help. And those notes became the basis for a course I started teaching. Um, I ended up teaching it both in person, online, elsewhere. And the, my knowledge grew as people asked me questions. Um, and so I started with the basics and the people who took my courses had phenomenal questions um, and I didn't know the answers. So I ended up spending way more time in, in the, the databases to, to answer those questions and then provide those questions to my participants in, in my courses. And then over time, people started asking me, 
hey, we don't want to take your course. We want the manual. <laughs> and I wouldn't sell the manual without teaching because it wasn't complete enough. The, the course plus the manual were, were complete, but the course, but the manual alone wasn't complete. So at some point it occurred to me, look, everyone's not gonna take your course. Um, and so why not put this in a book? And I thought, well, I've already got most of it done in the manual. <laughs> And as you know, when, when you go out to write a book and you think, I've got this and this and this, and I can use them. Yeah, but the, those things that you have written um, are connected to other things that are not in your book. <laughs> and so the book was incredibly hard to write, but I'm really glad I wrote it. So the, the reason why is twofold. One is people do such a bad job of it. Um, and it's not okay to do a bad job because it frustrates people. The, the data you get from, from your assessments is poor or worse. And people are sued on a regular basis for assessments that are poorly written and that allow people who know, know, what, know the, the content, um, but they fail or don't know the content, but they pass. And th that result is not acceptable. So I wrote it for specifically people who, who teach adults. And it's not that, the, not that anything in my book is different if you're not teaching adults. It's just that all my examples are adults. So I wrote it specifically for, and it wasn't written specifically for trainers or instructional designers. It was written for anyone who teaches others. Um, and let's face it, there are tons of people out there. I, I think of one of my clients who, who um, trains, trains women who have been out of the workplace a long time and, and are on welfare, um, trains them job skills. Um, and so everyone uses multiple choice questions. So if you're using multiple choice questions, you have to do a good job with them. So it's for any of those people. Now, I've had a couple of teachers buy it and they said they had to kind of think through the examples and figure out how to make those examples make more sense for a K through 12 audience. But it certainly will work for anyone who's teaching in higher ed and especially workplace learning and professional development. Um, and, and the main takeaways are, are how to do this very difficult skill so that you do it well. And so that the data you get from, from your multiple choice assessments actually helps you, one, know what, whether people met the learning objectives and two, um, gives you data to, to figure out whether your course is adequate. I mean, that's long-winded, sorry. No, no, no. That's that's it. So I, uh, well, let's get into the uh, the book itself here. And can you walk us through the sections and chapters? There were yeah. chapters in the original draft that I uh, read, and I don't know if this is exactly the same. But can you can you kind of walk us through each of these and tell us a little bit about it without uh, you know cannibalizing sales? Sure. <laughs> and cannibalizing <laughs> sales is unlikely because this is a hard skill. Um, so, so the book basically has, has um, <clears throat> actually, this is the book. Yes, show it to us. Yes. And, and I can't remember how many chapters it has in it, but it's got, it, it, it flows, it flows in the following manner. The, the very beginning, the first chapter kind of gives you an overview of what are we trying to do with multiple choice assessment? And it's really important for people to understand what we're trying to do. We're not trying to fi figure out whether people remember content. We're not. Um, and so we are trying to do very specific things. Um, and the most specific thing we're trying to do is have people met the learning objectives. That's, that's where validity of, uh, of our questions comes in and validity of the assessment. 
Um, we want to tie those two together um, closely. And so we want to assess, did people meet the learning objectives? Well, that means that the next section is, okay, how should our learning objectives be written? Because if they're written poorly, then we're, we're assessing the wrong things. Um, if, 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 you're asset, if you wanna figure out whether people can write a good STEM, for example, and the STEM is the question, um, you don't want them to, li to list the things that are, go in a STEM, you want them to be able to write a STEM or at the very least be able to tell if a STEM is well-written, which is a slightly lower, lower learning objective. And so we start out with, with what should it assess? And then we go into what should your learning objectives include? It's a lot of people in our field assume that learning objectives are, are an exercise. You know, that, that we just have to write these things first because that's expected wrong. <laughs> Nothing could be further than the truth. We need to know what people need to be able to do and how well they need to be able to do it, right? Um, and so we, the first thing we need to be able to do is write the learning objective. And the great thing about writing learning objectives this way is it tells us what to assess um, because most people don't assess the right things either. So here's another chance for the multiple choice question to go um, wonky and measure something that it totally doesn't need to measure and your assessment data is now garbage. So the second part is on learning objectives. And then the whole rest of the book is on using those learning objectives to write both well-written and valid um, multiple choice questions. Um, and so the middle part of the book is, is all about how to actually write them. Um, and there's, there's research behind the, why we have these guidelines. Uh, most of the research has to do with making sure that our questions are not easy to guess. And two, um, making sure that our questions are easy to understand because if they aren't, then we don't know what we've assessed. We've assessed their language ability, their comprehension of poorly written junk, um, we're not assessing the learning objectives. And so, so the middle of the book's about that. And then towards the end, I start getting into some finer details uh, of things like how to make a question higher, higher level. Um, what, what exactly are we assessing here? How do we, what are some of the techniques for making them higher level? And I get into scoring multiple choice questions and how to work with, with content experts. Because look, most of us work with content experts. We don't know that content. Um, or we work, we work with people, um, as you say, and, and you taught me a lot about this, about proficient performers. Because the real experts actually do things differently um, than, than proficient performers. Um, and so we want to assess proficiency. We don't want to assess next, necessarily expertise, although in some cases we might want to. Um, and so we need to understand what the tasks are and how they're measured. If we don't understand that, then we need to work with a, with a proficient performer to understand that and to assess them. Um, so I've got, I've got a section in the book on how, to, how is it, if we're not writing our own learning objectives and then we're not writing our own multiple choice questions, well, how do we end up with good multiple choice questions? Um, because a lot of us have to do that. And then I get into, um, towards the end of the book, how do we actually assess the quality of our multiple choice questions? Because we have to. And that's, that's the, the basic book. The book is um, short. Um, I used an application to tell me how long it would take to read it. And they, they said three hours, two to three hours, but it's also dense. It's a dense book. So four to five hours um, 
with doing the exercises, something like that. So it's not a tome. It, it's something somebody can get through and then start using right away. And, and one of the other things the book includes is exercises and answers throughout. Yes, I thought that was very helpful. And I really think that it was an, an easy read. You, you say it's dense, but I found it easy to read. And I thought it's very actionable. If somebody said, okay, I need to go do this, this is a guide for people to help them actually I mean, through the whole process, as you say, from starting in terms of, you know, what are we trying to assess and what are good uh, uh, measurable learning objectives and, you know, how do I write these uh, multiple choice questions and you even get into four different formats. Yes. Um, so I think that it's, it, it's a great help for developers. And I, and I also think that one of my comments about, you know, this is good for designers as well, you know, when people are wearing that hat and even analysts, because if they understand that this is what we're going to be assessing, will the analysts generate the analysis data? Will the designers then be informed by that and lead right into development of, yes. you know, as, as good practice dictates, I think we start with, you know, the application um, either exercises or uh, multiple choice questions or some, some way to begin to assess whether people have learned what they need to know in order to be able to do, to perform. And right. I, so I think that this is a great guide for people. Um, and I felt it, it really, you know, I don't do this for a living anymore. I used to way back in the day, but, uh, but I thought this is something that if I had a staff and they were going to be writing the, the content, they would need to start with this to understand what are we going to assess? And then let's build the content to do that. So we can, you know, uh, get well, extraneous content. That's a really good point. And it's also one of the reasons I got into multiple choice questions because Figuring out what people what what the end result needs to be is the start of everything, um, and so I say it's the start of multiple choice questions and and the start of assessment. But assessment's the start of of activities and content. Um, yep. So so I mean this book could be ten times as as long, and take it further to to this is what people need to be able to do and here's how we measure it. This is the, the multiple choice questions and how, how to write them and, and measure what we need to measure. This is the content and activities that need, need to be provided. Um, I'm totally aware of that. And I wrote that knowing that, that this is the start of everything. Even if you're not writing multiple choice questions, I've had a couple students take this course who mainly write um, simulations or, or situation-based um, scenarios. Um, and multiple choice questions are scenarios if they're well-written. So, so I had um, Nick in Australia say he took it because he was having a hard time figuring out he could come up with the correct answer, but he didn't know how to come up with the incorrect answers. What does research say? Well, multiple choice questions tell you that. Um, so I've had people take this so that, that they can write better scenarios um, and, and use a research-based approach to that, um, which ties into what I said earlier that we don't wanna make our questions easy to guess. Um, and by following the research-based approach, we end up with, with questions that are much less likely to point to the correct answer. Because, because our distractors, which are the hardest part to write, are, are plausible. Yep. And so how do we make them plausible? So, so this whole thing really is a, an exercise in thinking about design, um, but I wrote it because Look, people, people have trouble with design. What do I put in the course? What content goes in here? And usually a content expert gives them stuff to put in, but it doesn't necessarily lead, and you know this because you write about it all the time, it doesn't lead to the result of you are able to do this task with these outcomes. Um, um, that's not how that, that content expert learned it either. You know, 
but they think because they know all this stuff that you need to know all this stuff. So it's, it's when I say it's dense, what I, what I mean is there's a lot to it. It's not, it's not a simple skill, but I hope, and I've tried to do this with every book, is to pick out the, use the Pareto principle of picking out the 20% that makes the difference in doing it well. Yes, thank you. So let's let's take a moment and step back a little bit. This book is one in a series. So you have several books that came before this and you have another one that you are already working on, You Glutton for Punishment, You. Well, uh, you, you can't say that. You're doing <laughs> the same thing. <laughs> All right, okay, that's fair. All right, so tell us about the series you have a name for the series, and I'm blanking on that right now, but tell us about the series as you've titled it and talk us through the books. And uh, so right. we'll focus on just this one. So the, seri the series has focused for me on things that are very important pieces um, that, that make learning deeper. I use the word deeper and I don't mean it in the sense of computer science. Um, where, where, or AI, where, where machines can learn. I mean it in the sense of if we do things a certain way, people are more likely to be able to use what they learn on the job. Um, and so um, I, the things that, that I've written books on are things that are problematic in, in instruction everywhere. Um, and so the first book I wrote, which... Um, is writing and organizing for deeper learning. I learned through, through many of the things I do that if we don't write well, I mean, this is obvious, right? But, but it becomes super obvious when you start reading the research that, that if things are not easily comprehended, then we are not training them. We are not teaching them. Um, and so our very foundational skill as a designer is writing. And yet so much of what we write is difficult to understand. So that book sells really, really well because other people get it as well. But, but the book was written to be short. Um, and I, I tried to make all my books fairly short, but I, I wanna add things to that book that are really important today. And that is, how do we write for digital learning um, and add that? that so I, I didn't write specifically for that. I would just wrote for general learning. And so um, I've been reading a whole bunch of things um, to add that to the book. So writing and organizing will be the next book to come out and it'll come out when it's done because uh, you, you seem to be able to just sit down and just keep writing. I, I, I am so jealous. I, I need a break um, because my head's full and <laughs> I need it to be emptied a bit. But I, I hope it'll be out um, by mid-2022. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe a little earlier, but probably not. And the focus on that one is going to be writing for digital well, it's going to be writing, writing and organizing okay. um, for learning, but but there'll be a whole nother section in there about what the research says about writing for digital modalities, mm -hmm. um, which is super interesting. Um, just to give everyone kind of a taste, the research is clear that that we don't uh, comprehend as well in digital modalities. So all the things I talk about, like clarity, the whole section on clarity is 10 times more important in digital. And, and also answering the question, when should we give people print? Um, and and the, research ex the research actually is pretty clear and has been done over and over because people, people don't want, there to be a difficulty with reading in digital. Yeah. So they keep doing research, hoping to find another result. And basically the result is the same, um, that, that comprehension is lowered. Like for, in e-reading, 
on an e-reader. It's lower. We, mm -hmm. we don't think it's lower when we're doing it, but we don't remember as much because there are things missing. Um, so it, I find it fascinating. And I think for those of us who are, are writing for digital, audi digital audiences, which are a lot of us, um, we've got to know what the research says. Oh, all the more reason to buy the uh, paperback versions of your books <laughs> than the Kindle versions. But I agree. Convenience of the kind of eBooks and all that. Uh, I don't know, but uh, I'm looking forward to this next book. Now you've already you. uh, whetted my appetite on that. So tell us uh, where can people buy uh, write better multiple choice questions to assess learning and your other books. Where can they find them? They're all on Amazon. Um, I, I started self-publishing after publishing through a regular publisher because one of the problems with regular publishing in my mind is that the author gets fairly low amounts of control over where things go. Um, and it's very important to me if I'm talking about an image that that image is right there with the, with the text that's describing it. So I, I just decided I'm gonna learn how to do this. Um, and by the way, it was really hard for the first three books, but it's, it's, it's easier. And a the reason Amazon is, is that it's international. Um, so, and if you put my name in, Patty with an I, Shank, S-H-A-N-K, um, into wherever your Amazon is, you'll find all of my books. Um, if you want a specific, and it, you know, it's got this really loud green. So, um, and it's also the top selling one of my books right at the moment. So it should be at the top of the list. If you want a link directly, um, just go to my webpage, which is pattyshank.com um, and Patty with an I, Shank, S-H-A-N-K. And right on the front page, there's a link to that will get you to your Amazon site. Well, I will put all the appropriate URLs in the show notes for this YouTube video. And uh, I will also put it in the blog post where I'm going to uh, uh, announce this video, which will probably go up tomorrow. But uh, Patty, thank you so much for uh, spending some time with me today and, and talking a little bit about this this latest book and the one that's coming. And uh, I, I, I thank you so much for all of your contributions to the profession because you've been doing that for quite a while now, but, but thanks so much and have a great day. Thank you very much, Guy.